Hey there, this is Sharing Global Views. To our honorable speaker, hosts, teammates, and our lovely audiences, warm greeting to every one of you. Sharing Global Views is a show that we share thoughts and creative ideas with professionals and leaders globally. So far, we've covered many fascinating topics. You can find more videos via our YouTube channel. And today, what are we going to explore together? There's inspiring news to share, isn't it? Yeah, thank you very much, Hina. Like you just said, we have talked about topic from art, from education, and to even going to Antarctica. Everything that we talk about is amazing, but it's all still around the earth. Now, the sharing economy really extends beyond the earth. Now we want to go up even further to the space. So really raising the topic to another level, which we really, really excited to have another very exciting speakers today. Um, but before we introducing our real speakers and the main host, please let me just uh, mention a little more about uh, Glaze. So Glaze is global alliance of sharing economy. We try to promote anything that is associated with sharing economy. And we want to have people to join us to really share a thought and also asking good questions. So this Sharing Global View program is actually designed for this. So anyone who will be interested to have anything associated with the sharing economy, please come in, ask your questions and see different opinions actually from around the globe. Now we want to even go out to the space. Please allow me to introduce a very important main speaker of today and every time, or standing chairman of the Glaze, President Host Maria Figueres. How are you, President? Hey, President. We want to have you unmute. Hello, President. We want to have you unmute and then- I am so sorry. I am so sorry. <laughs> Uh, I was saying uh, thank you, uh, Elena and T. Good evening in Beijing. Good morning on the Americas and good afternoon in Europe. Thank you for joining us again for another conversation of this series put forward by Glaze, the global sharing economy uh, organization, Alliance, which is a nonprofit non-partisan, non-political um, get together of people around the world, all interested in promoting the ethos, the tenets, the concepts of a sharing economy. Uh, in a world where population is increasing and we should also concern ourselves with increasing the well-being of people around the world, but in which the planet is not growing any larger and resources are finite, the sharing economy becomes a great way forward in terms of living better together, accommodating our needs without transpassing the planetary boundaries of earth. And this opportunity to speak about the sharing economy brings us John Spencer. He is the founder and president of the Space Tourism Society, which he will tell us all about. He's a co-founder and chief designer of Mars World Enterprises. He is above and foremost an outer space architect. He has been promoting tourism economic activity, wherewithal awareness with respect to outer space. And if you think about it for a moment, friends, there is no place like space to share. Uh, we all share out there. And if the collaborative work that we put together between many nations in space, uh, in different endeavors and with many different objectives, we could bring back to earth and work in the same collaborative spirit in which we work in outer space on the planet, this would be a much happier and better planet. So John, 
thank you so much for your pioneering work in uh, space. And uh, please uh, share with us your presentation. Thank you, Mr. President. And I appreciate the opportunity to share some of the background on the space experience economy, space tourism, and some really interesting ideas about the future. So we can just dive in right now. And I do it, like I say, appreciate you uh, inviting me to this. I, this is a very interesting organization you have. And I agree that sharing opinions, ideas around the world uh, is a way of people collaborating and getting to know each other. So we can go to the next slide. So I'm gonna share, share some very interesting ideas, some novel ideas. Some of them might be out there a little bit in some people's opinions, but I wanted to start this presentation by saying this is very, very real, uh, the space experience economy. And for example, the two richest men in the world right now started rocket companies so that we could reduce the cost of access to space and eventually build up the infrastructure so more people and companies and nations can mm -hmm. actually have space and utilize it. So uh, next, please. And there's a huge amount of interest in the economics related to space and the space industry. So Morgan Stanley has done some good studies showing that by 2040, we should have at least a trillion dollar specifically in space, space oriented economy. And that will continue to grow from now on. Next. Uh, and the billionaires have gotten involved for the last even 10, 15 years or so. Right now, there's more than 10 billionaires, some of them very famous, who have actually started or invested space tourism or space enterprise companies. These are some of the most famous billionaires or are representing some of the most famous brands. And one of the reasons they've done this is they grew up in the Apollo program, the beginning of the space age, find it fascinating as young people. Some of them became rich so they could do space and are doing it now. And the business community finds this amazing that these people, almost all of them totally self-made, are now focusing a lot of their energy, times, and reputation on establishing the space industry. Next. Now, our view through the Space Turn Society is that we have what's called the space experience economy. And that's the overarching name for three key mediums that people experience space, real space flight, actually go to space, earth space with space museums, space camp, space theme parks, and movies and TVs and games. Uh, the Space Turn Society, we're based in Los Angeles and we're involved in all three of these mediums and have been for years. There's a real synergy between them supporting each other. And next slide, please. And what's great about this evolving industry is there's different levels up this ladder you can go. If you're into this industry, into space, Throughout your lifetime, as you become more affluent, you can have ever increasingly real space experiences that cost more money, take more time, and have more risk, but are more real. That means the corporate sponsors can have customers uh, for life. So this is going to grow and grow, and it's just now evolving into something really tangible and very exciting, and the media really enjoys covering it. Next. And the space tourism industry has been by far the most profitable. Seven people have flown to space as private space travelers. They spent tens of millions of dollars given to the Russians. And other than the cost of vodka, caviar, and their spacesuits, the Russians, all of that was profit. I could get into later detail why that's true. But we're forecasting that the space tourism industry will be the fastest growing and largest industry in space for decades to come. And the core reason is people want to have life-changing major experiences. And once you've been to all these different locations on earth, you wanna go do something different. So this industry has capabilities and mass and interest and it's inspiring. Next. It the space tourism industry started actually on April 28, 2001, when a friend of ours, Dennis Tito, wealthy businessman here in Los Angeles, paid the Russians $10 million for a ride up to the International Space Station we spent 10 days on board the space station, had a great time and returned to earth. And next please. And this is an image of the International Space Station. And one of the great things about space exploration and development is it's not just one country or a few countries. There are 16 nations involved in having put together and operating the International Space Station. 
Uh, so we can actually, in this case, go outward into the solar system together uh, as people of Earth, and there's no one we have to conquer in this new environment. It's very exciting, and a huge amount of great science and inspiration is generated through these programs. Uh, next, please. Uh, these are the seven, uh, the six people who flew after Dennis. And what's interesting with these people, they've all returned, and I know most of them pretty well, and had that life-changing experience of seeing Earth from space is called the overview effect, where you see the whole planet, no borders, how beautiful our planet is. And people come back with a desire to share this unique experience with everyone and to talk about how we of planet Earth, you know, we're all uh, astronauts essentially on a big spaceship, spaceship Earth. Uh, what's also interesting here is one fellow, Charles Simone, flew twice. So we've now had a repeat customer for space tourism. Next. So real, real space flight, let's look at what's happening there. Of course, most of you probably know about SpaceX and the advantages that they have actually being able to go to orbit. Boeing is working on their own uh, rocket system and uh, capsule to take people to orbit. Next. But SpaceX is remarkable. Uh, they have an operating system of taking people to and from space and cargo supplying the space station. And what's really cool is Elon Musk is an innovator, an entrepreneur. And on one of the missions uh, a number of years ago, he actually flew his Tesla. He's also co-founder of Tesla Motors, uh, flew his Tesla into space. It's in space right now. And uh, the astronaut's a mannequin called Starman. Uh, Virgin Galactic recently had its first uh, passenger flight that was in July that does suborbital flights they actually do not orbit the planet. Uh, Space Perspective has a wonderful amazing project they raised a lot of money for they're going to be flying in 2023. A beautiful spherical gondola under a large balloon out high altitude up into the stratosphere so you see earth with the curvature dark sky very soft and mild flight up flight down so many more people who can't uh, take you know zero, uh, the zero gravity or the G's of a rocket flight can actually fly this. Next. And Jeff Bezos uh, formed Blue Origin and uh, flew actually in July, July 20th, the anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing. And his vision has always been since high school to become wealthy so he could invest and develop space infrastructure so we could move out uh, into the solar system. He's very focused on the moon as a long-term objective and is developing his own lunar landers, twice the size of the Apollo lander, and is just sailing along very well. Next. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Inspiration 4 is a milestone, a big change in the evolution of the space tourism industry. Here, a private wealthy person chartered, chartered a space flight for him and his friends to go into orbit. And they did that September 15th through September 18th, lifted off on a Falcon 9 rocket, had a wonderful time in space for three days, great landing. We'll talk about that at the end of this presentation and what that means, but they did it. And this shows the diversity of what's happening as evolving space experience economy. Next. Uh, there's so many players, and these are real people, real corporation. Axiom Space has a deal with NASA to design and build and fly and add to the International Space Station more habitation modules that can double the occupancy. Eventually, when the space station retires, they will break off from the space station and have the world's first privately owned space station. Uh, Bigelow Aerospace has been flying inflatable modules, which is a new, unique form of outer space architecture where a uh, package is closed up, goes to space and opens up, gives you more habitable volume area. He's got a module on the space station and two others in Earth orbit. Next. Uh, and and uh, just a while ago, a Japanese billionaire made a deal with Elon Musk to have a lunar flyby. That's where you actually take off from the Earth, go around the moon, and just return back. And you experience what's called Earth rise. You see the Earth rising above the rim of the moon. That hasn't happened with anyone for 50 years about. So uh, within the next two to three years, We'll actually have the extension of space tourism to flybys of the moon. Space Adventures is also planning flybys of the moon as well. Next. Now, Earth-based uh, simulations. Next. So Earth-based space tourism is thriving. 
hundreds of millions of people a year go to space themed or science themed attractions, shows, museums, science centers. Uh, and there's billions of dollars in planning for new space attractions uh, in the works right now. Uh, the National Air Space Museum in the United States gets three and a half million people. And here's a very interesting fact. When you count up all the space attractions in the United States alone, there's more around the world. That's about 18 million people a year go to those attractions. They physically get up and go to the attractions. And that's almost as many people who go to the very famous Universal Studios, the two studio theme parks in the United States. So there is millions of people a year that have space related experiences on Earth. <laughs> The Kennedy Space Center, where the Apollo missions launch, where now Elon launches his rockets, is expanding with more attractions and shows. Uh, one of my companies has a proposal for a $2 billion Mars-themed entertainment attraction for Las Vegas called Mars World. Uh, next. And in Mars World, the concept, it's a city of the future you get to visit, and the future is a key part of the theme. The city is on Mars, but it's in the future, so we have a huge range of ability to tell stories and to show technologies and a positive, healthy view of the future. Next. Uh, in Los Angeles, they're gonna be building a quarter billion dollar building to house the real space shuttle Endeavor. Uh, right, and it'll be raised upright in what's called the vertical stack. It's gonna be an amazing attraction and a hub of space activity and programming and STEM uh, science education. Disney's had since 2003, it's pavilion at the Epcot Center called Mission Space. About 5 million people a year take our trip to, spit to Mars and back. So since it's been open, almost 90 million people have been to Mars and back. And all these Earth-based attractions connect people to space and inspire young people to go in careers uh, in space. Next. Uh, there are 27 spaceports around the world right now and more are in planning stages. This is images of Spaceport America, where Virgin Galactic is actually based out of. And this building was purposely built to be a spaceport and to engage in private space enterprise. So Earth-based infrastructure in support of space access and information and education is very strong and growing. Next. Space Camp in Huntsville, you might've heard about that. In the last 40 years, almost a million kids have actually gone to space camp, summer camp, teamed up and done space missions and a wide variety of missions with the shuttle and all kinds of different things. And a number of them have gone on to become professional astronauts. So these camp experiences and kids love space are very enhancing to get kids interested in math and science and to have careers in technology areas. And this is one of my favorites, uh, Space VR is merging entertainment industry with technology and space imaging, where you get to wear these VR goggles you have live streaming from the space station going over the planet. So you have real images of the earth and then you're in a buoyancy tank that's enclosed. So it's silent and you're floating in the salt water and you feel as though you're observing space in zero gravity. And they're uh, building more of these facilities around the world. Next. Movies and TV. Uh, for many years, I've been a consultant for movies and television shows on space related things. Uh, and right now we have something very exciting happening, a new kind of space race. So Tom Cruise had announced last year that he wanted to fly to the space station with his director and film guy and actually film scenes inside the space station for a theatrical movie, one of the Mission Impossibles. Now the Russians said, hold on there. Uh, so they want to fly up one of their actresses and directors first and beat Tom Cruise. And that's going to be uh, on October 5th is when they fly. So we have this interesting com uh, competition of who's going to be the first uh, A-list group to actually film theatrical scenes for a feature movie inside the space station. And NASA has said, great, let's do it. And this is very exciting to see this new uh, space movie space race happening. Next. And there are two major groups right now putting together in pre-production these major television shows modeled after Survivor, where the contestants will compete and the winner of these shows are actually flown to the International Space Station. So here's a way of, if you don't have millions of dollars, actually competing to actually be able to fly to space station and experience space. This is very exciting. You'll hear more and more about this next. And beyond the technology, you have to get into space fashion, space food, space music. How do you create these wonderful space experiences? And since the early 80s, 
We've actually modeled the space tourism industry after the cruise line industry. It's a very good industry model. Uh, with all the elements you have in a cruise ship, we want to be on orbital cruise ships. So that to widen the range of disciplines involved in designing and creating and operating these ships. Uh, and next. Uh, and all of the arts are getting involved from music, artwork, uh, hairstyling, fashion, clothing. So more and more people who never thought in their lives they'd be involved in space are engaging in their ways through their creative efforts to help us move outward into space. This is a very exciting time. We call it the space renaissance where anyone can get involved and bring their ideas to the table. Next. So I'm gonna show you a few future things, but I always like to start off with this, uh, this little slide. So uh, this is from Arthur C. Clarke, one of the great science fiction writers. And uh, I've experienced this in my life, most of my life, where I come up with ideas and when it says, you know, it's impossible, don't waste my time. And they say it's, it's possible, not worth doing. And then they say it's a good idea and I'm going to invest now. So um, that's pretty typical of new ideas and concepts. So next. So this is my concept in space architecture design for an orbital super yacht modeled after ocean uh, yachts, super yachts. And my concept is to migrate the ocean yachting industry and the richest people and richest corporations in the world into having the orbital yachting industry and then eventually lunar yachting so that those powerful people who have influence can actually go to space, have that overview experience and hopefully come back and themselves saying, I wanna do more for everyone on this planet. Also, this is a cool, fun thing to design orbital super yachts. Next. Uh, this is Destiny, the yacht. Uh, those four sails collect solar energy and radiate heat away. The center of it has a float sphere, 60 foot in diameter, where you can just float around. And this would be operated with professional crew and eventually docked with uh, orbital yacht clubs, just like the ocean yacht clubs. And you need the uh, Space Guard service modeled after the Coast Guard service. So the whole infrastructure of the yachting industry will be migrating up into Earth's orbit and beyond. Next, almost done. Uh, this, is an, this is actually from NASA, believe it or not, 20 years ago, the idea of having lunar resorts and golfing on the moon, which has already happened on Apollo 14. Next. And another concept, this is actually dune buggy racing on the moon. Now these seem wild, but 25 years ago when I started the Space Tourism Society, the idea of space tourism was laughed at. This would never ever happen. Now it's happened and it's growing. So these visionary ideas sound crazy in the beginning, but eventually they do happen. And that's how humanity has always moved forward. Ideas that become reality. And the sports industry is huge. You have to have $2 billion to have a Formula One team. So it's not unlikely we'll have racing on the moon uh, within a couple of decades. Next. And this is my favorite quote of all time. And I, I totally believe this and I, I want everyone to think about this and be involved in this. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. It's to invent the future. We can all invent the future together. Now, these last few slides, I just want to cover that uh, inspiration for mission. So uh, this is extraordinary. And as I say, the next big step uh, in the evolution of space tourism industry, a guy charters a flight, brings his friends, they go to space, they have a wonderful time and they return safely. But what's interesting here is they raised over $200 million for St. Jude uh, Children's Research Hospital, $200 million. So this combines space experience and philanthropy together and we'll be seeing more and more of that uh, in the future. Next. So they launched from the Kennedy Space Center, the same launch pad that the Apollo missions took off from. And of course, Elon has his Falcon 9 rockets and capsules and uh, this beautiful gantry walkway and so forth. Next. And these three days in space, they just had a great time. And one of the fantastic things they did, you see this cupola, the image below, that's the fellow who paid for the whole mission, a couple hundred million dollars. Uh, Elon's company put together this beautiful dome on the nose of the, of the uh, dragon, a capsule, so they had a great view, which they did. Next. And they safely returned to Earth. It was great. They actually danced some of them out of the capsule, which was really pretty cool. But this is a sign of evolving evolution of the space experience economy, the space tourism industry, space experience, and things are happening today. And you'll be amazed when you hear things after this uh, early next year that's in the works as well. 
So this industry is thriving and everyone is welcome to become involved in it. So thank you for the opportunity to share this. John, thank you ever so much for a wonderful presentation on the space experience economy. Uh, when you were going through some of the slides, it is just absolutely wonderful to see how broad the economy around the space activity has gone and in so many different fields. And when you mention now the uh, raise of the $200 million for the, for the hospital, uh, the way that we're able to combine, shall we say, social investment or philanthropy uh, with this economy. Now, um, <clears throat> take us a decade out, John. Where do you think we will be in the space experience economy by 2030? Well, we're going to have uh, private space stations, a few of those in Earth orbit. We're going to have people having returned to the moon and starting to build moon bases that eventually evolve into lunar resorts. Those are plans in the works. I'm actually working on some of those as a designer. Uh, we'll have more and more attractions on Earth, more real space academies, but not just for engineering uh, academies that teach you how do you cook a fine meal in space and what is space fashion. And you're totally right. There's such a diversity of people and disciplines now engaging in creating space experiences. It's this renaissance of creativity, of wealth being put into this, of science being learned, and of creating a future that's inspiring, exciting, and sustainable. And sustainable space architecture is the key for all of these facilities and spaceships. So by 2030, You'll be seeing a lot of enterprise in Earth orbit on the moon. It's possible by 2030 that Elon has sent a genuine manned mission to Mars uh, by then. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, T, do we have questions coming in from our audience? Yes, sir. Actually, we get a very good friend of us, uh, Mr. Scott William. Uh, he's unable to enter due to bad connection, but he said, please ask this question to John. Uh, what is your inspiration about Mars World? And will there be Mars beer, Mars cocktails, uh, Mars language? Yeah, <laughs> yes. absolutely. Uh, we know Scott, he's a great friend. Uh, the concept of Mars World is the city of the future. It's all inside this large dome. Uh, and all the things you see in a city from restaurants to culture, to art, to entertainment, to all kinds of things will be happening. But thematically in this invented world, we're inventing a world uh, within our vision of the future and all this. So Martian beer, for sure, it'll be very light because of a low gravity. That's a Mars joke, actually, low gravity, light beer, that kind of stuff. We're working on the humor part, don't worry about it. Uh, but we hope to build these around the world, three or four of them, and let them be hubs, centers where people come together. We're gonna to build Mars world communities where they're involved with some of the creative work and jo finding jobs. And one of the key things I'm asked many times is from people who are almost feel desperate, they want to go to space, they can't afford it, they don't think they're gonna win a competition or a contest, what, what do they do? And I look at them and I tell them, well, work in space. Work in space. We need people to be on these uh, orbital cruise ships to cook and clean and to guide them and to be the captain maids in space, uh, performances. And I've seen numerous times people who seemed almost desperate brighten up saying, oh my gosh, I never thought I could have a career in space and I could go many times because it's my job. And that opens a whole universe of a life for someone that they could be involved in something they care about and are excited about. Mm -hmm. um, John, one of, one of the areas uh, that I would like to ask you about is research. Uh, scientific research, uh, because I imagine that there must be a plethora of opportunities to conduct scientific research in space uh, that for different reasons, um, gravity being one of them, perhaps may not be conducted on Earth. Uh, what about that? And what, where do you see the most promising fields? I'll start with the end of your question. Part of the most promising is sustainability because spaceships and moon bases and lunar resorts and Mars cities have to be as self-sustaining as possible, recirculating the environment, growing their own food, 
being concerned of every ounce of energy and so forth. So a lot of work is being done on how do you make space facilities more self-sustaining. For research, there's a huge, you're right, range of research being done from unmanned vehicles. We've now visited all of the planets in our solar system with our space uh, probes. Uh, right now, there are three active rovers on Mars, every one of them collecting the information and data, sending it back to Earth. Out of the 18 satellites that are in Martian orbit, eight of them are still in, uh, operating, getting a huge amount of science. But one of the core things that NASA is shifting toward and other space agencies are collaborating is looking backwards on Earth and um, dealing with issues of climate change. And we've learned more about climate change, the oceans and the upper atmosphere uh, from space and our satellites, our weather satellites and our uh, climate monitoring satellites than from any other physical source. Uh, but there's research in the most, uh, most of the research on the International Space Station is medical. How do people stay healthy in space? How do you deal with radiation issues and so forth? So there's a proliferate of different kinds of research being done in space. And now universities, a university class can actually assemble a satellite about this big, you know, it's called a CubeSat, get it for free on a rocket that goes in space and does real science with a real class having their own satellite in orbit. And that's revolutionary that people can actually do this themselves. So the infrastructure is growing to expand scientific research, a great variety of fields, and a much wider range of people doing that. And we have a growing range of what's called citizen scientists, people who are interested in astronomy and looking for asteroids. They're cataloging stuff. They're, we have so much data from space. It, many of, most of it hasn't even been looked at by scientists because there's so much of it. So it's a golden age of science, and that's going to grow as well. Hmm. Fantastic. Um, why do you think that uh, space professionals are also uh, very much future, futurists? Because we're always talking about 5, 10, 20 years down the line, the destiny of humanity. And if we take the attitude as futurists, futurists tend to look at many trends at one time and see where they converge and that convergence accelerates both of those trends or three or four trends and improves upon it. So one of my pet peeves in my discussions all the time is we are, we're space people, but we're futurist. And the more futurist we get involved, we'll have a clearer <coughs> view of the future and amplify ways that we can use different industries to accelerate what we're doing. Thank you. T, Elena, do you have other questions that have come in? Yeah, we have um, one question from our audiences called Siki. Is okay. there time? Okay, mm -hmm. can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we Voice? can. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, dear Mr. Droz and uh, dear Ms. Zhang, and my name is CK and I come from China. And uh, what a coincidence is uh, yesterday in the Chinese uh, lunar calendar, it's just the mid autumn festival. So in Chinese history, that is the, uh, on that day, uh, people can see the brightest and the biggest moon throughout a year. So I think everyone, single one in China has a dream to uh, walk or even dream about their walking in space or on the moon. So here comes my question. And will the space tourist, tourism always be a luxury product or a by the improvement of technology and the price could be as cheap as air ticket now. And how long will it take according to your prediction now uh, for us to see a busy earth orbit full of orbital flights? Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, thanks for that point about China and the moon. I know the moon's very important in that culture. Yeah. Uh, so, as I mentioned, there's a diversity of ways of going to space. You can be a professional astronaut, a cosmonaut, techonaut. You get, it's your job to go to space and you get paid to go. You could be a private space traveler, space tourist if you're wealthy and you can pay. Or you could be gifted the opportunity like they just did on Inspiration4. The wealthy fellow chartered a mission and three friends went for free. Uh, mm -hmm. And then eventually as the industry grows, there'll be opportunities for more and more people to work in space in jobs that are different from being a scientist where you're actually 
cleaning a space station or you're cooking the food or you're maintaining it and so forth. So the diversity of access to space is growing. The cost is always going to be pretty high if you have to pay for it for decades to come. But you could win a contest, work in space, be a professional astronaut, be gifted an opportunity to go or win a contest such as the hero or discovery uh, who wants to be an astronaut. So the pathways to space for the general public are growing and diversifying and engaging more and more people to pursue those pathways. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank um, you. Do we have another question from the audience? Yes, uh, we have uh, Mr. David. Um, I, I think you're in the, in the Zoom call. Do you want to um, uh, show your face, turn on the camera, and ask a question yourself? David, you're on mute. Here I am. Do you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Perfect, thanks, uh, Mr. Jose Maria. Uh, in your opinion, which is the best way to enable a more rapid and viable human space exploration by lowering um, the cost of access to space for developing countries? If, in example, Costa Rica. Uh, we do have a lot and great talent, but not the money to get full access to space. What do you think about that? Thank you, David. Well, more and more countries have started their own space programs. And a lot of these space programs are forming alliances around the world with other emerging space programs and sharing resources. So you might have say a dozen countries that can do say one part of a space mission, but if you collaborate with a bunch of other countries, they do other parts of it. Collectively, you have an enormous amount of resources of money, technology, talent, experience. So it's a collaborative effort of national space programs that benefit everyone involved and will accelerate not only the science and the education from space, but more and more of their people actually going. And as I mentioned earlier with my concept of orbital super yachts, it turns out in the yachting industry, an ocean going yacht, no one pays to go on an ocean going yacht. It's a gift, an invitation. They exist not to make money in a capital sense, like a cruise line makes capital money, they exist for a certain so for social profit, for pride and prestige and social standing. So as more of those yachts get built and yacht clubs where people work at, more and more people will go to space. It will be expensive if you're paying for it, but if you work there or it's a gift or you win a prize, more people will go. But the more emerging nations collaborate, the more they can do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Marlon, do you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Maria. So I did uh, make a question in the chat. I asked about uh, what are the, 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 the opportunities for countries like Costa Rica in this kind of economy? Uh, have we uh, opportunities to participate in this kind of economy? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, as I said, uh, companies or countries who are starting space programs can collaborate with other countries that might be more advanced in one area, but a country can focus on a certain area and the teaming of those companies amplifies their resources and uh, budgets and knowledge and capabilities. Now, People within countries can also participate in competitions uh, to fly to space or to solve problems and win prizes for doing so. But collab the, the core thing about space for humanity is an opportunity to collaborate, to form alliances and to do things together, to go out in this very difficult, hard environment. But it's what humans do. We explore, we go to new places, we try new things. And that's why we've advanced to where we are today. And it's a golden opportunity to move outward from our home world and create new worlds uh, in space. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question and then we'll have to be closing up. We're coming up to 45 after the hour. Uh, do we have another question from the audience? 
Yeah, sir. Um, we do have one. Uh, it's very interesting, sir. John, you've been in the space and tourism industry for very, very long time. And from from it heard that it's over 25 years. You know, how did you actually get started on this concept for a very, very long time ago where a lot of people was not even talking about space tourism at that time? You know, how did you live with all that time and how, where, how what made you started this? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for asking. Um, I always start off by saying I was 13 years old when Apollo 11 landed on the moon. And I was enthralled with that adventure, that danger, but they succeeded. And at the same time, the US there was this TV show called Star Trek, where people were exploring outside uh, of our solar system and the, and the 2001 space movie. So, uh, so I always loved space and science, but I'm a designer at heart. I'm a des that's what I am, I design. And I realized in the late seventies, I could combine my love for space and science and exploration with my love and design for designing and architecture and sustainability way back then, put them together and become an outer space architect. There weren't any outer space architects, just two other guys were starting to get that. Uh, but I love pioneering, trying new things. When I'm designing it a blank page, I call it exploring the design frontier. You got a blank page and you go on a design adventure. And uh, in the early 80s, I realized, having looked at the big picture, that tourism eventually will be the biggest business because people want to go to exotic locations and are willing to spend the time and money to do so. So I began talking about that. And for the first decade, people laughed at the idea. They really did. Particularly the aerospace industry were hostile towards the idea of space tourism. But I knew I was right. And I knew in the future it was going to happen. And I was going to be part of it no matter what. And by actually doing the real space projects, I finally got contracts with NASA and helped design the space station interiors. Uh, but I also did themed entertainment projects, theme parks, exhibit, touring shows. And I actually became a real estate developer myself and learned how to raise millions of dollars in money. That in itself is a design project, how you design a company and how you raise money for it. And I talk really loud and I get excited about all this stuff and get people involved in it and stuff. So doing the real stuff at credibility to the entertainment, the entertainment stuff paid the bills and together they're, they're becoming more and more together, merging. So I'm, I'm very happy that all that challenges and working very hard is now starting to pay off. Plus I get to tell people, you know, I told you so. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. You have to be polite. They say, I told you so. That's a wonderful, wonderful way to come to a close. Uh, John, thank you ever so much. First of all, thank you ever so much for being a pioneer, uh, a, a, a true inventor, a, a true entrepreneur, uh, 25 years ago when you started the Space Tourism Society and you started talking to the possibilities and the opportunities of sharing in outer space. As I was hearing your presentation, again, I was so enthused about the fact that, you know, if the, if, if, if the cooperative spirit that nations come together under to explore outer space, we could bring back to Earth, uh, we would be so much more advanced in opportunities of well-being uh, and uh, livelihoods, thriving livelihoods for people. So you also help us in that regard, and we, we thank you for that. Your presentation on the space experience economy and how broad it has gone in only so few years and your vision of where we could be by 2030 is, uh, well, inspiring. Uh, so thank you so much, John. Uh, we hope to have you back on our series of conversations uh, in the near future to continue to explore your pioneering work and what we're doing out in space. And on behalf of uh, Godfrey, T, Elena, and myself, we not only want to thank you, John, but we also want to thank all our participants uh, for having joined us uh, for this presentation of globally of sharing global views thank you so much friends and we'll see you again in a couple of weeks have a great day evening or morning wherever you are bye-bye thank, thank you so much bye-bye thank you so much bye -bye. Bye -bye.